Everyone here is living a big life, and many lives in one. Big, full lives such as traveler, student, parent, partner, friend, pet owner, worker, business owner, maybe side hustler. For me, the essential lives are five. Writer of poetry and biography and fairy tales. Teacher of writing to adults and fairy tales to the eight and under set at my kids' school. Spouse to my best friend. Mother to our two often wise and always wacky children. And friend to many generous and inspiring people I've met along the way. Each one of these lives requires space for spontaneity and growth. And each one of these lives requires sacrifice that I'm prepared to make. The story that I will tell today is about something that happened when a single life began to require sacrifices of time, money, and energy that I was not prepared to make. And this is the life of home dweller. Once upon a time, or a decade ago, I was a graduate student studying fairy tales. I drove a red VW Beetle and had a badly behaved corgi. <laughs> and I was falling in love over state lines between Texas, my childhood home, and Idaho, where I would move as an adult. After getting married and merging my bad dog with his good Labrador, <laughs> my husband and I moved into a small two-bedroom starter home. And in order to have a place for me to write and for our guests to stay, we built in its backyard a 250-square-foot tiny house that we called The Shed. It had an aqua concrete floor, a desk, a bathroom, a kitchenette, and a ladder that ran up a two-story bookshelf that led to a sleeping loft. I had no official job at that point, neither did my husband. We were both inventing as we went. I spent my days writing at the desk with my feet on the aqua floor, and he spent his trying to figure out a job he could do that would allow him time with our children when we had them, and ideally that would not require shoes. <laughs> we stayed up late and dreamed up big moonshot goals for our future, and our life felt as simple and beautiful as a poem. Then, in a whoosh, our poem got complicated. A baby girl was born. We got a more sensible car. Then a baby boy and a second car. My bad dog died. We got a puppy. <laughs> My husband and I both started businesses. I took a teaching job, then a second teaching job. And in all of this, we outgrew our starter home and moved into a much bigger house and rented the starter home with its backyard shed. Eventually, the new house needed siding, and all of its machines needed repair, and the puppy kept swallowing the baby's socks. <laughs> I would find them in piles in the backyard. <laughs> and being a believer in reduce, reuse, recycle, I would pick them up, wash them, <laughs> put them back in the baby's drawer. <laughs> Everything was hard to afford. Everything required time. Everything required multitasking. It was all still beautiful, but in a big, messy, impossible to remember the details way. One of the things that I love about poems, both reading them and writing them, is their deliberate attention to detail. The space on the page, margins, that frame the words and ask us to really look. This is true in a little block of a prose poem, or a book-length epic, or a tiny 17-syllable haiku. The poet must use the most precise language possible to create a moment and invite the reader in. A poem is small, yet has great impact. In contrast to a poem, my life at this time felt huge, and my attention scattered and I realized the disconnect. 
In writing, I could edit. Writers know that editing is much harder than writing, that what we take out matters more than what we leave in. A writer might write four pages in a single morning and then throw three and a half of them away the following day to leave just what is essential. But life is bigger than writing. And in many ways, my life in this era was beginning to feel uneditable. There were several teaching jobs now, many writing jobs, hundreds of moments of beauty every single day, but very little space in the day to appreciate them. My life was full, both of the work I had chosen and of the constant shadow work of keeping a house. Many nights, my husband and I stayed up late to tidy the house, only to fall into bed too tired to talk. In many days, my children wanted stories, but I didn't have the energy or the focus to tell them. There are many books I dreamed of writing, but found it a struggle to take any one and make it into something. I saw that if my life were a page with writing on it, it wouldn't have any margins. I was afraid to edit my life, because what if I edited the wrong thing? What if I missed an opportunity? What if my children missed an opportunity? What if my first choice fell through? Didn't I need second, third, and fourth choices? I built a life with all the pieces I'd ever wished for, yet I hadn't figured out how to distill to see the poetry in it. I spoke about this with my husband, our main house fixer, and the collar of plumbers when one of the children accidentally flushes a diaper. He felt similarly that our life had grown too big. We joked briefly about how we should take turns sending one of us to live in the little backyard shed behind our starter home so that we could have, ironically, space. <laughs> but it was just a joke. And we realized that this was life, and life was complicated and that adult life is not like a poem at all, but more like an epic novel series <laughs> with many, many subplots. But still, if I could not stay organized within the walls of my home, how could I begin to organize anything else? And if I could hardly afford my family's daily needs, why dream beyond them? My page was full. Why write anything else? The real risk of an unedited life is disconnection, a feeling of being disengaged from the life you've built, and a sense that all its parts are just items on an impossible list. It is an everyday claustrophobia and a grief and guilt at having abandoned the essential things. My big house, which I loved, went from feeling like a symbol of the success of all of my lives to a symbol of my failure. I needed to edit something out. And if I didn't, I knew that I was going to lose these years. Remember, only their chaos and none of their beauty. That I would live and miss my life. The catalyst came one night in the spring of 2017 when the big house was a disaster. The cleaner had canceled. The puppy had eaten an entire dollhouse family. <laughs> the kids had gone to bed in a stalemate over a Lego ninja. And I was lying in bed, entertaining a fantasy about jumping into a lifeboat and letting the whole ship of our heavy house sink. I had been scheming, as I often did at night, about how I would keep our family afloat, financially, housewise, and joy-wise, when a scenario emerged. We could go into my lifeboat together. We could move as a family to the shed, bringing only ourselves, small suitcase each, and the dogs. It was midnight when I found my husband still working in his office, and I proposed the impossible. My husband looked terrified. <laughs> I was talking in the middle of the night, not my usual hour, about abandoning ship, the ship he and I had worked so hard to navigate and keep afloat. 
I told him we would live in a dwelling that cost literally nothing. We would rent both houses and save the money earned. We would be portable. We could close up house easily and travel more. We could teach our children to think less about their own wants and more about the world and its needs, all by requiring less at home. And when we needed space from each other or the kids, we could just go do something outside the house or go into the sleeping loft and close the trap door. We could take our partially weathered selves, our nine-year marriage, and our rosy new children and enjoy it all properly. Then the idea clicked and he got out his notepad. We spent the rest of the night working out the details and plotting until dawn. And for the rest of the spring, a taut new energy sparkled around us. If we moved to the shed, what might be possible? When we told our friends our plan to leave the big house and move to the tiny one, many were baffled. A few called us up to check up on us and see if we were okay. <laughs> and one friend asked, have you ever heard of a concept called moderation? <laughs> but it didn't seem like shed dwelling would be that hard. All over the world, and for hundreds and thousands of years, families had lived in small dwellings, in less space and with fewer luxuries than we had. In our mind, it would look like early retirement, the way people downsize houses in their twilight years. Only we would do it with work and kids. It would also look somewhat like camping, but with hot water and flushable toilets and quite comfortable beds. We didn't see why it wouldn't work. But still, I worried that such a move was not fair to our children, then three and six. And doubts cluttered my mind, such as, you're not giving them all you had. You're taking away their toys. You're forcing them to leave the house they've known. So I asked them how they would make this work, and their answers were beautiful, concrete, and creative. My children decided immediately that our shed would be a sharing house, so they could both maximize their toys. And they took their four small wooden bins and collaborated on which toys they would both enjoy most. They also went through their clothes and picked their first choices and made big second choice piles to give away. I saw them editing their own lives and figuring out how to be generous in a way they'd never been in the big house where they hadn't had to work within such boundaries. So then we had a huge yard sale and rented a storage unit for things we thought we might want again, such as art and the bed, and found tenants for the big house. We packed supplies for a small kitchen, our favorite books, and eight outfits each. This is one of the eight that made the cut. <laughs> we packed plastic bins in the garage, with off-season supplies, and my husband and I began sharing an office. We added to the shed a Murphy bunk bed for the kids and replaced the desk with an expandable dinner table so we could have friends over in the winter. And then we moved. The results were immediate. It was as if we had taken four pages of writing and distilled it to a perfect haiku. Overnight, our conversations changed to be more about the fun of life and less about the maintenance. We had time to talk, time to just be in a room together, to make up games, take spontaneous after-school adventures. We had everything we needed, but nothing more. And we had space in our day, margins, to reflect on our life and appreciate it. Shedding our big life inspired me to think of how I might live like a poem in other forms, too. I asked myself, if my life were a page, what would belong on it? And if each day were a short poem, what would be the right words? And I found that answers came easily and were fairly easy to implement. There would be more making, less management, more doing things with love today, less worrying about doing them perfectly one day, more talking, less technology, 
more walking, less driving, more storytelling, less housework, more time with people in the world, and less time by myself at home. I decided I would start telling my children stories whenever they asked. My husband and I set up a standing Tuesday night date, as well as a short weekly meeting for household business so it wouldn't metastasize all over the rest of the week. We set up a dog share for a sweet, wild puppy so we could have her half the time, and a retired athletic couple would have her at the other half, and it would give us <laughs> and the old Labrador a break. I streamlined my work so that I would teach part-time for one college, write one poem a week, and write one book a year. And I set limits on how many hours I would work each day. And as a reminder to myself to work economically, I made a sticker for my laptop that asks, is it necessary? I made it a priority to get outside more, even just for a half-hour walk, and to see friends more often. And never once for a single day have I done all or most of these things perfectly. But living like a poem is what I aspire to, and I'm better for the practice. Our life still has plenty of chaos. Case in point, last week, one of the children sent a handful of blueberries through the wash, so now most of our clothes are purple. <laughs> As we approach our second anniversary as Shed Dwellers, I see more and more benefits of writing a life small and well, of writing all of the many lives we live small and well, leaving space for creativity and spontaneity and joy. So in the end, my family's move to our little shed is a story about giving up rooms in our house in order to have more abundant room in our hearts. And it's an act of bending the real to meet the ideal life by asking two questions. What do you love? And what fills your day? When these questions share an answer, you spend time differently. You pay attention differently. You add something to the world that only you can add. You add your poem. Thank you.